Uh, so, hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the RSA. Uh, I'm Matthew Taylor, Chief Executive. Uh, delighted that you could join us uh, this evening. Can you make sure your mobile phone is switched to silent? But don't turn it off because there will be an online conversation taking place through Twitter. The hashtag is RSA uh, Hilton. And also hello to all those people who are watching this event uh, online. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's special guest, someone I've known for many, many years, actually, Steve uh, Hilton. Uh, Steve is co-founder and CEO of the American grassroots political website Crowdpack, a visiting scholar at Stanford University, and of course, most well known to you, I'm sure, as former director of strategy for David Cameron. We are both former number 10 insiders and one of the prime movers in the modernization uh, of the Conservative Party. Steve's uh, with us this evening because he's published uh, a book being human, I'm sure you read a lot about it, in which he argues, well, he argues all sorts of things, but he argues we're in need of a fundamental rethink of the way we govern, educate, do business, run our public services, eat food, treat ourselves, die, bo get born, I mean, everything, really. Uh, he says our systems are failing because they've grown too far from the human scale, and we need to remedy this by putting people back, not just at the heart of politics, but every aspect of modern day living. It's a fantastic book full of wonderful ideas, much of which I agree with, some of which uh, I didn't. Uh, it's incredibly uh, it kind of carries you along with its enthusiasm. Now, what was going to happen was I was going to do that, and then Steve was going to talk for 20 minutes, and I was going to ask him questions and be over to you. But of course, it's Steve Hilton, so uh, nothing is allowed to be as it's planned to be. So uh, uh, Steve told me four minutes ago he's not going to do that. He's going to do a kind of elevator pitch for about five or ten minutes about his book, and then I'll ask him some questions, and then you can join in. Uh, but let's just make, you know, let's just be a bit unconventional. Feel, a, feel free to shout out. You don't mind if people shout bollocks in the I middle of what you say, or <laughs> hooray, or... You know, whatever, I just... I think that should be practically compulsory. Yeah, so just, yeah. you know, chip in whenever you want to. But the basic structure is elevate a pitch from Steve, few questions from me, open it up to you. Please welcome Steve Hilton. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. I'm sorry if I'm living up to the parody and sort of turning this into too much of a Californian experience for everyone. Um, it's a great, great pleasure and a thrill for me to be here. I love the RSA. I love Matthew. I think I'm allowed to say that now. Um, it really is an honor, and I really appreciate that you came along uh, this evening, and I hope we have a good conversation, which is why I wanted to reorganize things a little bit, uh, if that's okay. Um, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the things that um, has pleased me as I've uh, come back to the UK after being away for a few years in California um, is to see the, uh, the resurrection of the, of the, some, I don't know if any of you have seen a website called the Steve Hilton Policy Generator. It's quite good fun, and you might want to have a look at that. Not right now, uh, but at some point. Um, uh, because I do have a reputation for, uh, for some ideas that are often described as mad or crazy. I even use that term in, in my book. Is this book just a list of all the crazy things that I wanted to do in government, but they wouldn't let me? Um, it's partly that but it doesn't get quite as crazy as some of the things I've seen this week. Uh, my favorite was in a piece in the Times on Saturday, which was a, a version of my week, as understood by Hugo Rifkind, which had a whole list of fantastic ideas, uh, including my favorite, which was that we should require welfare recipients to eat beetroot <laughs> so that we could recognize them by their tongues. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's, that's definitely going in a memo to the Prime Minister. Um, I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed going on TV programs where basically all they really want to do is not interview me, but show clips of the thick of it and the character that, uh, that portrayed me. That's the real agenda. I'm very happy to give that another airing. Um, and, uh, and I hope that uh, you'll find some of the ideas we discussed tonight, if not completely crazy, at least stimulating. Um, I wanted to start by, by telling you the story uh, that you'll find at the beginning of the book, um, because... It's a story that really gets to the heart of what I'm arguing in More Human. Um, as Matthew mentioned, I have, a, I have a business in America now, a technology startup. It requires me to travel a lot around the US using internal flights. And uh, as anyone who's experienced them knows, that can be a pretty harrowing experience. But nothing quite as harrowing as, as this story, uh, which I tell at the beginning of the book. It's a lady called Jennifer Devereaux. And she was on a flight uh, from, I think, Boston to New York or something like that uh, with her young children, including a three-year-old daughter. And they're on the tarmac at the airport. And uh, there's an announcement that there's been a delay and they're, gonna, they're stuck there for 45 minutes. Um, so they're sitting there and her three-year-old little girl announces that she wants to go to the toilet. 
since they're sitting on the tarmac, she thinks there's nothing wrong with getting up, taking her to the toilet. The minute she does that, a member of the flight crew comes racing down the aisle, tells her to get back in the seat, you can't go to the toilet. She says, but she's just three years old, you know, come on, what's the harm? Nope, got to sit down. A few minutes later, the little girl's saying, no, I really, really need to go. She tries again. Same response, you've got to sit down. And then, a few minutes after that, this three-year-old girl wets herself in the seat, in the airplane. And so her mum, Jennifer, asks one of the cabin crew for something to clean it up with. Can you give me a napkin or a tissue or something like this? And she doesn't hear anything again. The person goes off, doesn't come back with anything. So I see the little girl is sitting there, as you can imagine, incredibly upset. She's upset. It's horrible. She remembers that she has a jumper in the um, overhead bin. So she gets up to open the bin and get the jumper. At that point, a member of the cabin crew comes back, tells her to sit down. The captain's got the seatbelt sign on. You have to take your seat. She said, Look, I'm just getting a jumper to clean up my... No, you've got to sit down. So totally defeated, she sits down. A few minutes later, the captain comes on the intercom and says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry, but we have a non-compliant passenger on board, and we need to return to the gate to remove them from the aircraft. Referring to that lady and her little girl and the family. And the reason I think that's an important story, although a very, very small, uh, small one in the overall scheme of things, is that it actually tells us a lot about what's gone wrong with the world and what we need to put right. Because if you think about the people involved in that story, the, the employees of that airline, JetBlue, as it happens, but it could be any airline, the, the members of the crew and the captain, they would never behave in that way to that mother and that little girl if they met them in normal circumstances. The way they behaved was completely inhuman. And they wouldn't normally do that. It was the structures and the systems and the bureaucracy and all the rest of it that made them behave like that, the security rules and the protocols and whatever these airlines have to go along with. It was the systems that have been designed that made them behave in an inhuman way. And I think that's what's happening right across people's lives, whether it's the way government behaves, the way that people are treated by public services, and also by businesses like that airline, but many others too. In our daily lives, we constantly come across instances of behavior like that, and we have a system of government, public services, and business that I think has become too big, too bureaucratic, too removed from the human scale. And that is the heart of the argument that I make in this book, that what we need to do if we really want to deal with the frustrations that people have, with the things that are going on in their lives, is not just think about changing the policies or changing the government. Um, it's actually taking a deep look at the structural issues, the causes of some of these problems. If we want to improve schools, if we want to tackle poverty and inequality, we've got to do so in a way that is more human, because in the end, these are questions of human behavior and the way people relate to each other. And we're not going to get the kind of transformation that I think is, is, is possible for us to achieve in the outcomes we want to see by continuing with these outdated, broken systems that were designed in the 20th century. They achieved quite a lot of progress in the 20th century. Let's give them that in terms of the welfare state and, and these, these big bureaucratic systems that government created. They certainly got us to a certain point. But I think we've reached the end, really, of what we can expect from those. And we need to do something completely different. We need to rethink the way we run these things. And we need to make them more human. That's the argument in the book. Um, I apply it to most of the things that, uh, that, that government worries about, that public, people working in public services worry about, not to absolutely everything. Um, you did go through a long list of things. I can see my publisher, Gail Reebuck, Reebuck right there, who, uh, who, who af absolutely did a big edit. I think the original chapter list was about 33 different things, and now we're down to 10, so that's, that's something. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about all of those, because I do think this is something that, that affects us right across the board. It's not just about politics, it's not just about government, it's about the way we live our lives today. Thanks, Steve. So I just want the room, those people who haven't read the book or read uh, extended reviews of it, just to get a sense of the radicalism of it. And so therefore, let's just choose one particular area, which is schools. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, you, you, what you're arguing for in the, in the book is that we should have a complete dismantling of the kind of inf the, the infrastructure of schools, 
that we should kind of have the free schools policy we want, but times about 50. And that in every community, there should be lots and lots of schools run in people's gardens and houses and huts and shops or wherever. Anywhere parents want to get together and run a school, they should be able to run a school. Those schools should be small, no more than 150 pupils. So a complete kind of break, breaking down of the... Is, I mean, am I character... Is that, that's right. is that no, correct? No, that's in, a very good summary. That's, that's, now, that's so let me ask you a question. To the ask, vision of what I'd like to see. Let me ask you a question I asked you earlier, which is how on earth do you think we could ever get to that world, given the fact that people in this room, even if they might find that idea quite compelling, could Im I'm sure people could come up with 20 powerful objections almost immediately. And this is a kind of progressive, enlightened audience. This is not the kind of Daily Mail editorial thinking about how they can, mo you know, they can monster an idea like this. Yeah, well, let's, let, before we get into the um, objections, let's look at why we might want to do this. What is the reason that I think we need such a dramatic change in the way we organise education? I think the reason is that the world is changing and, the, and the, the things that we need to teach our children at school, if they're going to succeed, are changing, but the school system isn't changing. What we have today is what I describe in the book as a, it's not my original phrase, I think Anthony Seldon's used it and others, it's a factory school system. We have these big institutions, typically as one or two or a small number in every neighbourhood, that operates, at, in, in my view, as a factory. It's a very good comparison. It's, in, it's sort of standardized. It's an industrialized system. The children are processed through it with a very defined set of outcomes that we want to see, which are then tested and inspected and evaluated by the system, which is basically run from, from London uh, or Edinburgh or wherever. So that's the current system. Now, I think that it's, it's clear that you can squeeze better results out of that system if you want. That's what's been happening. I would say the, the last five years of the, of the government showed that you can improve that a little bit um, and get better results and improve things. But if you think about what's going to be needed in the, in the century that is coming ahead of us rather than the century that we've just been living through, it's a completely different set of, of, of skills. It's not so much about academic content and, and children learning academic content. It's much more about their character. It's about the kind of capacity they have to operate successfully in a world in which they're going to be, uh, they're going to need to be much more entrepreneurial, much more ready to cope with setbacks and ebbs and flows and disappointments and therefore resilience and grit and all these things that are now becoming buzzwords in the educational field. But I think they really mean something. Those things are important. The ability to collaborate, work in teams, to be creative. These things are a world away from the kind of um, things that are easily taught in the factory model. So the reason I think we need change is because the world is changing and we need to prepare children for it. There's another drawback from the current system, um, which is that the increasing focus on um, academic uh, results and testing and drilling and all of that stuff is actually not just failing to prepare children for the world that they will be operating in, but actually causing mental health problems, not just for them, but for their parents. It's making people miserable, making children miserable, making their families miserable. It's bad news, and we need to change it. That's why we need to move to a different system. Now, I'm not sitting here as some educational expert with the perfect answer for how children should be educated. I think the truth is that children are different. They have different talents and aptitudes, different ways of learning, and our school system needs to reflect that. It literally cannot reflect that as long as you've got these big factory institutions that all operate the same way. And so what I think we need to see is a flowering of different types of school that cater for the different types of children that there are in the world. Some will be academic. Some will be at the other end of the scale. There's a school that I talk about in, in More Human in Texas, in Austin, which explicitly says, we do not teach content, we only teach character. It's, it's a, the vision of the founders of a school with no teachers, where the children self-organize, the older te children teach the younger children. I've visited it. It's an amazing school. The children do incredible things. They actually do better on the tests, because they still have to take the tests. They do better on the tests than the kids who go to the school where testing is the thing that is focused on. Um, now, that's at the extreme end, but the children, uh, the, the school where uh, my children, where my oldest son goes, is a kind of milder version of that. You know, they do some academics in the morning, but in the afternoon they're doing project-based stuff, they're, they're, they're making things, they're, 
they're being creative, they're, it's, it's a, they're, they're focusing on social and emotional learning. All this is a world away from what we have today. And I think we need to allow that kind of education to flower. And I think we need to allow people to experiment with different approaches, to try things out, to see what works. We have technology now that enables one school to learn from another school. And so you're not going to get that until you decisively break with the current system. You need to create the opportunity for new schools to be set up. And that's why I argue that actually one of the most damaging things that, that is said in the realm of education is this, um, this, this mantra that all people want is a good local school. Forget about school choice, forget about all this structural reform, just give me a good local school. Well, if we just focus on that, if that's all that we aim for, you are guaranteeing a factory school because a good local school is a gift to the centralizers, to the standardizers, to the people who just want to impose one view. And I think that we need to move away from that. We need not just one good local school. We need 20, 30, 40, as Matthew described. That's an accurate description of the kind of thing I want to see happening. It's happening where I live, in California, and I think we need to let it happen here. So... You talk about decisive break. Let's just, let's just stay on this issue. So you talk about decisive break. Now, I know that when Tony Blair, because I was working for him, and I was ambivalent about the policy, first set up the first academies, that was a decisive break in favour of school autonomy and diversity. And then when the decision was made to expand the academies programme, that too was a decisive break in favour of school autonomy and diversity. And then when the coalition came in and said there'd be even more academies, that was another one. And then the free schools, and that was another one. And then yesterday, we had another one. So we've had decisive break after decisive break, all in pursuit of more autonomous and more diverse schools, yet you know if you go to any of those schools, whatever their form of governance, they will tell you that what drives them is Ofsted uh, and fear of Ofsted. And in fact, that fear of Ofsted has been cranked up in yesterday's Queen's speech to an even mm -hmm. higher degree. So there will not be a head teacher in the country who does not think they're six months away from losing their job because they might slip into the, a category for, for six months. Why is it that all that intention to create greater diversity and greater school autonomy in the system has failed entirely to deliver what you want, which is genuine diversity and a kind of school movement which is driven bottom-up by parents and parents and what they want, rather top-down by some notion of national uniformity? Because I, I don't think those are decisive breaks at all. I think they're small, timid, first steps. They're good because they're moving in the right direction, but they're nothing like the kind of thing. That's why, actually, funnily enough, I think it's important that I use these numbers to give you a sense of it. It's not just one or two schools. It's not just the, the, uh, the school that, that may... I'm not going to use the famous phrase associated with, I think, Alistair Campbell to describe the... Box standard local, comprehensive. Local comprehensive. It's not just one or two alternatives to that. It's 20, 30, 40. That's the scale of it. Right. Now, now you're not okay. going to get that uh, so if, under, all your, if, if the limit of your ambition is one new academy. Right. So I understand that, Steve, but, but w w who is responsible for that? So if I, if I was to say, let's ask, if I was to ask the room, tell me your objections to Steve's idea, and someone put their hand up and say, what about safeguarding? And someone put their hand up and say, what about crap teachers? What would, someone would say, what would you, you know, for school? I mean, look, it's only 15 years since Ofsted came into Lambeth and found children who were kind of 11 or 12 and couldn't read or write, and that's why that inspection system was created, yeah. because there was some very poor practice taking place. In a, it, so in the face of all these objections, it wouldn't actually be the politicians or the system or the bureaucrats, the targets of much of what you write in your book, it would be us. Be the public. It would be us who would say, actually, we're not willing to take that level of risk. It's fine in California. We're nice middle-class people and, you know, maybe well-paid teachers and nice kids and it's all funky and wonderful. But, you know, are you going to try and do that in other parts of the country where, you know, the kids have got really deep challenges, it's really hard to attract good teachers, there's kind of extremism in the air, whatever. So I think that, I think that how, how, how are we going to accept this world? I think that, you know, I think it's, it reminds me of, and I, I, you'll think this is a flippant comparison, but actually there's, I don't mean it as such, and I think there's more to it than that. It does remind me of, you know, I grew up in Hungary. Um, uh, I didn't grow up there, my family is from Hungary, um, and uh, I spent a lot of time there when I was young. And it does remind me of the conversation that, you, that you'd have with, um, uh, you'd see reported, uh, I, I also studied um, the economics of communist countries uh, at Oxford, and spent a lot of time, you know, academically looking at that. And there was this constant conversation with people who ran things, system, big bureaucratic systems in the Soviet, well, Soviet Union. Well, how do you 
ensure that there's enough food, that the right food is in the right shops if you don't control it? How, how, how does that happen? How do you make sure it's safe? How do you, and and the, the idea that the only way of guaranteeing good outcomes is for someone at the center of a system to decree that that should happen is, is not actually true. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't apply in other areas of life. Now, what I'm saying is that the, 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 there needs to be a, there's always a balance in any system um, and a choice to be made between kind of, you know, the, applying rules and setting rules from the center that will run systems or allowing people to have discretion. I think that it, that's, a, that's always a tension. And, and so when we get into the details of looking at how a system like mine might operate, then, of course, there needs to be a conversation about, well, what kinds of things um, do we really care about? There needs to be a central system for redistributing resources, for example, so that people don't have to pay and money follows pupils and all the rest of it. So, there's, there's, of course, there needs to be some kind of central uh, role still. But um, I think that the, the real answer to the question is trust people. I think that parents understand what makes a good school for their child, and they are the best judge. And what you can add to that with technology is um, requirements around uh, transparency, reporting of that, data that people can use, that other services can interpret for people. There's a whole set of things that we can do to give people better information and to make a system like this work without the kind of um, uh, centralized control that we're suffering from at the moment. You see, the thing that's always said is, well, you're, there's all these risks with your system, and you know, what about all the things that could go wrong? But it's not as if we have a perfect system today. You can't compare. You know, it's, it, there, there are things going wrong today. There are schools that that are captured by extremists today, even in our centralized system, and then look at all the downsides of it. So I think that it's certainly worth moving in this direction. I would go, and the government is, you're right, they are moving in that direction, and I applaud that, but I think we need to go massively faster and further if we're going to get the change we need. Well, I, I, I'm bringing in a comment at the back. I'd say that government is, is, what the government is actually doing is moving in this direction in one area and in the reverse direction in another area. So schools find themselves right, faced with the, the rhetoric of, yeah. they're faced with the rhetoric of autonomy and diversity, and they're faced with the reality of an incredibly right. tight and tightening grip of central regulation. Yes, from the back of the room, there's a question. I'm glad people are just putting their hands up. That's good. Can you raise your hand again? Yeah, go on. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, a few a few issues. Firstly, I don't just, think there just is. Just give us one, though. All right. Well, <laughs> our, our, one point and then one question. Yeah. Um, so I don't mean there is actually a difference in learning styles. Uh, how we learn is a sort of cognitive process. There's evidence that people have different preferences, but I don't think people learn in different ways, and there's quite a lot of research about that. Um, uh, and certainly presenting stuff to people in different ways helps them learn. But the question I wanted to ask was, was really about, you know, there is, a, uh, there is sort of science and knowledge and understanding to what we teach. Uh, and character, creativity, these are things that come from the knowledge that we have. And what, what elements of that curriculum, whether it's science or history or um, English or maths, are you intending that some schools should do differently? And how do you stop some schools kind of doing some of those things very badly or not at all? So let's bring in another point and then I'll ask you to, yep, wait for the mic. Um, on a sort of more broader policy question, I mean, both of you have worked uh, from, from the side that actually has to implement these policies and bring them to, to, to people like us. Um, how, how on earth do you go from, the, from having the perfect ideal of how something should be um, to bringing everybody along, um, along that journey of change with you and to be able to implement, implement that in a way that doesn't involve this sort of top-down reorganization that we've seen that, that actually goes against all the principles that you're, you're trying to talk about because well no, everyone knows because brilliant question and then front row here and then I'll, and I'll bring the audience but I'll bring you all back in again at various times but yep Martin hi um, what would um, tell us who you are I know you oh, are, but, oh. Martin Robinson um, if it was the Fagin free school of pickpocketing or pock picketing or whatever it's called um, how would you stop that would you want it uh, to be stopped, or were you quite happy for it to carry on? And uh, especially in the East End of London, I should think that school would be. So let's put these, let's put these, 
Not any, the East End of London now, they're all hipsters, I'm afraid. Uh, they're pick, pick our, picking our pockets in different ways. Um, so there's, there's three different, let's put those in a kind of particular order. So I, there's the first question, which is, I mean, I think actually, I'm make that, would you have a national curriculum of any kind at all? Um, secondly, what would you do about bad people running schools, teaching people to become you know, thieves? And, and the third question, of you done those, because they're about schools, the broader question. I, I interviewed Steve this afternoon for the RSA Journal. And I accused you of being much more keen on A and Z than B, than B and Y, in the sense that you, you, A is how, how crap things are now, and Z is how wonderful they'd be in Planet Hilton. But the kind of B to Y of how we go from here to there is of less interest to you. But we, we talked about that. But I think yeah. that's kind of what you're getting at, sir. Yeah. yeah. I think that um, the, I, I, on, in terms of learning styles, I, I'm not, you know, we can sort of trade research. But I think the one thing that we can agree on, I hope, is that even if you don't accept that there's, uh, that there's a difference in learning styles, and I think there is, um, there's certainly a difference in learning pace and, and, and the ability of a, of a teacher to customise the education that a child receives within the classroom is really important. And that's really hard to do in, uh, in a big school and in, um, in the standardised setting where there are sort of... Um, but would you have a national curriculum? Hang on. I just want to no, say, go on. So, so I think that... that, that you, you, that's, that would be my response on learning styles. I think that even put, take that off the table, I think the, the pace at which children learn is really different and, and, and needs to be customised. In terms of the curriculum, no, I don't think there, I think that um, there's no need. I think that there are so many resources available now um, online uh, for any school in the world to choose from. You know, if you think about, so the school that my son goes to is the um, Khan Lab School. It's founded by Sal Khan, who set up the Khan Academy. Um, and the idea of it is to create a, and it's described in, in the book, um, and the idea of it is to create resources for schools to use, literally to, to take that curriculum and apply it. Now, why does there need to be a national curriculum? I think the idea is ridiculous. Um, in terms of the um, uh, stopping bad people running schools, I think that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the first point is, I don't know why you think that parents would want to do that. I mean, there's a sort of basic assumption there that parents are idiots and I think that that's um, just you know, I, I, I just see the world a different way I, I guess I think I trust people more um, to be fair in Oliver Twist they didn't have any parents you see that's the that's the pro <laughs> that is the problem with your metaphor isn't it really but uh, uh, I, I, I think that um, uh, I think that the and to the, to the the A to Z question I think this is a really important point I think that um, First of all, I think that in terms of the, the, the mechanics of making this kind of change happen, it's, it's, it, actually it's not as complicated as it may seem. And I think that the way to show people, um, sort of bring, you ask, how do you bring people with you? I think with a lot of things like this, the, the, the theory, you, you people can argue with the theory, but the best possible way of um, making change happen is, just to, is, is actually to allow it to happen. Where I teach at Stanford, at the D School, uh, there's a sign up there saying, you know, the, the, only, the, the only way to do it is to do it, or something like that. I think it's a John Cage quote, um, which I'm probably getting wrong. But um, I, I believe there's a lot of truth to that. Just don't, don't argue about it. Just do it. Just see, just see what the results are. And if they're no good, then do something differently. There's no, nothing in what I've said that's imposing anything. It's allowing you, if you want, if you want to, it's, it's allowing you, if you want, uh, to start a school. That's it. And if, if no one wants to send their children to your school, then that's the end of it. But if they do, let's great. I want it to be lively, but I also want to bring lots of other people in. And um, by the way, there are a lot, I mean, the, the principles that Steve has elaborated for schools, he then, he, he, he applies to health. Uh, he applies to, to, to government uh, itself. He applies to how we tackle poverty and inequality. So feel free to allow your questions to range over other subjects. This is not a kind of conversation exclusively about education. My goodness, what a lot of people want to ask questions. Let's, so try and keep them punchy if you can. There's three people here we'll start with. Three men. Uh, hi, Steve. Julia Manning. I'm already enjoying your book here. Uh, that said... And uh, my interest both education <laughs> yes. and health. 
No, it's nicely done, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, lots of interesting ideas, but, but quite simplistic. And that, that, you know, the implementation bit, massively uh, missing. And, and I was quite interested to read that you said, you know, the problem is structure. Well, um, you know, time and the, the kind of the received wisdom is it isn't about the structure, it's about the content. And for, for myself working in health and my husband working in education, it's about, you know, the regulation, the lack of discretion is, you know, is really stifling, but that's not the reason to, you know, reason to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And the reality is when my husband works, which is on the largest uh, uh, council estate in London, 15, one five percent of the kids come from stable backgrounds. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff that they're having to do there just to get those children through the day and, and get them you know, achieving. And if they were then told, well, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom and you can do what you like, they, couldn't. they need structure. They desperately need structure. Yes, they need more, um, uh, more flexibility and, um, and more creativity. And by the way, character's about morality. It's not about you know, um, resilience and, uh, and grit. It, it, you know, characters are moral constructs, and that's a whole other uh, uh, you know, debate, but uh, but I, I just I just feel fun, you know that um, your your points about structure are are not borne out by existing evidence. And the question I want to ask, though, is oh really? <laughs> how sure. how would we ever afford this? How could we ever afford it? Okay, very good. Uh, pass it back. If you can if you can kind of more on the question and less on the ruminations would be good. Uh, although that was great. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Um, there are so many opportunities. I'm, I'm an RSA fellow here. There's, there are so many do you have a amazing. Name as well? huh? So do you have a name as oh, well? Oh yes, sorry, Lucy Wills. Okay. I was just going straight in there. So there are so many amazing initiatives across all the different um, uh, operations of society that you're talking about. Um, but at the same time, there are, certainly in the UK, they're underfunded, under-resourced, and really not being given the opportunities that they need to even begin to test things out, let alone succeed in the long term, in my opinion. My challenge is this, that I think that there's a real danger that too much of what could be core government function is being delegated into these new structures before they're actually ready, and we could end up with people being, large numbers of people being really badly let down. Okay, thank you, and then finally? for this round. Grace Wright, um, do you worry about a postcode lottery? What if you get a neighbourhood where actually no parent wants to run a school or nobody wants to open a hospital in their garden and what do you do about that and about pulling people into those mm. neighbourhoods to make sure those kids don't get left behind? So I think all these questions basically amount to your ideas are great but you know Britain's a bit of a horrible place really and <laughs> You know, maybe California, but I'm not sure about Stoke-on-Trent. That seems to be the general yes. tone here, but, you know. Well, maybe, maybe the idea that we really need to, to sell this is uh, the one I'm credited with uh, wanting to bring in while I was in number 10, which is, uh, uh, what they call it cloud-busting technology. So we have sunshine every day. Maybe that would, that would help. Um, I was going to take them in order to Julia's points. I think that um, uh, this book is, as I explicitly say at the beginning, trying to start an argument. It is about... Um, offering an analysis of what I think has gone wrong, setting out a direction, giving some indications of how, what that might look like in practice, but just, just to get the conversation going. This is not supposed to be um, uh, a, a manifesto, let alone an actual implementation plan. I know what those look like because I used to write them for, for, you know, bef before elections, so I know exactly what you mean in terms of actually making things happen. Um, it's just me with a book. It's not me, me with uh, uh, the ability, I think, to... Uh, and it would be wrong even to uh, suggest an implementation plan for, for this stuff because, as I, we say on the website for More Human, which, which people are responding to by voting for whether they like the ideas in the book or not, we also say, send us a better idea. If there are better ways of achieving the, the aim, then let's hear about it. This is supposed to be starting a conversation. I mean, specifically on the schools and, and children from, uh, from the kind of backgrounds you describe, I've spent a lot of my time in government focusing on, on those kinds of families. And now in San Francisco, I'm working with, with a fantastic pediatrician uh, who who's, uh, features in the book exactly on those problems that, that, that families uh, f with multiple problems, really, really difficult lives, 
um, have to contend with. I think it's exactly for that reason that you need um, uh, the ability to offer a more tailored and customised education, precisely because their circumstances are so different. And a one-size-fits-all policy, whether that's in schools or social services or whatever, just will leave people behind um, because they can't fit in, because they're human, they're different. Um, I think that... Um, <coughs> In terms of the structure, I think I just disagree with you about that. I do think that the stru as, as if we go back to the Jet Blue story, I think the structures they don't tell, they don't explain everything. I agree with that, um, but they they explain a lot of the reason that that in the end, the services that government offers don't really get to the heart of of of, of, of people's lives, um, and I think that's why decentralisation is important because then you're more likely to have decision-making that, that sort of understands the nuances of people, but also the, with the way policy is designed, you know, the actual process through which policies um, are made. And I think that that is a really important change that needs to be made, but both structural and operational. So I, I agree it's not all about structure, but I think it plays a big part. In terms of affordability, I think that there's nothing in what I'm arguing here that, that needs to be more expensive. I'm not arguing on the basis that it's cheaper, but it certainly doesn't need to be more expensive. I can't see what I'm talking about that, re that requires more money to be spent. It's not about that. It's about how we organise things. Um, on postcode lottery? Just Luce, well, hang on. Luce, Luce, uh, well, I think that Lucy's point about well, too, too much delegation downwards can lead to bad results. Again, I, just somewhere I think we just have to disagree. Like over here, I just think you, you, you know, either you trust people or you don't, fundamentally. And I think that you've got to... You've got to go with that. On, on the postcode lottery, yeah, I love the idea of a postcode lottery. Bring it on. I think that's exactly what we need. We need to get away from this ridiculous, outdated idea with such damaging consequences that it is either possible or desirable for people like us to sit in London decreeing what should happen everywhere in the country. Of course there needs to be variation. The only way you get progress is through variation. And so the, what the, but the key concept is therefore for me not postcode lottery, but postcode control so that you are in charge of what happens in your area. And that's, I think, the way to, 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 to make variation work in our favour. So, uh, hold on. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just going to, just for two or three minutes, move this conversation onto a, a, a different area of the book. But you can still ask the questions about whatever you want to ask your questions about. We, you, we're going to end up as a room disagreeing more strongly than we did at the beginning, not agreeing more strongly. Just, just be aware of that. That is what's going to happen, and you're going to need to read the book to, to decide where you, where you, where you, where you stand. Business. There's, there's, I know you, you go back on business, because your first book was my first got to know you about a good business. Now, in your business chapter, you say it's not as simple as big business bad and small business good. But then I get a bit lost about what exactly is it then that is the difference between, apart from kind of good intentions, between, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, look, I was thinking about this in a particular sector, and I was thinking hotels and bed and breakfasts. You know, it is true that some of the best experiences I've had have been in really lovely bed and breakfasts, but it's also true that some of the worst experiences I've had have been in little guest houses and bed and breakfasts. So, yep. you know, the, the small can be great, the small can be absolutely awful. And if I'm absolutely sure that I wanted a good night's sleep and I wanted a reliable service and be treated okay, I'd probably rather go to a large hotel cha chain than risk the fact that I was going to have a psychopathic B&B owner. So, you know, <laughs> tell me... Uh, just get me into this kind of theory yeah. about how we know a good business from a bad business. Um, I think that it's not, you know, I don't want to make judgments about it, but I think that it is important that we deal with this because much of our lives is affected by uh, business, not just as consumers, but as employees and suppliers and so on. So we can't just ignore it and say, well, that's, you know, we, we, we can't challenge the private sector. It is what it is, and let's just concentrate on government. I just think that's ridiculous given how much of our lives are taken up with with this and how it affects the social outcomes and environmental outcomes that we care about. So first of all, I think it's important that we engage in it. Um, I think the, 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 the argument I'm making is that, um, and again, it's a, it is a structural one. I think that, that that doesn't explain everything, but it explains a lot. The key concept here, I think, is the difference between a company that exhibits the characteristics that I think we should all support and welcome, which is entrepreneurialism, um, risk-taking, people who try and build businesses uh, that, 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 where they see what they're doing and they see their success as offering products and services that are useful, that people want to buy, that, 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 and they operate in a competitive market where they see that the competitive pressures push them in a positive direction. 
Um, now, that is not always the case with com competition, but what, what is typically the case where you, in the lack of competition is that you've got businesses that actually entrench their power, they grow very big, they stitch up markets to keep, in, to keep challenges out. Instead of thinking about what they do as providing great products and services and treating people well, they use lawyers and lobbyists to bend regulations in their favor to keep entrance uh, away from them and, and to stop themselves being challenged. And it's at that point that they become, <clears throat> they turn into what I describe as not real businesses at all, but kind of private sector bureaucracies. They behave in this bureaucratic manner that actually can hurt uh, consumers, their workers, their suppliers. You see it in the supermarkets where you've got this concentration of market power. You see it in other sectors too. Um, now, as I say, I'm not, I don't want to be too sweeping about it. It doesn't explain everything, but it explains a lot. And therefore, I think that, that as a first step, what we should be doing is to, is to really focus on, I think for me, the, the right debate, which is not pro or anti-business, but pro or anti-markets. You should be pro-competitive markets because that typically delivers better results, I think, for uh, anyone connected with the business. Yeah, so there's a strong argument against kind of monopolies, cartels, rent-seeking, abuse of power in, in, in the chapter. Now, I, I, wanna, I was reading the book last night, and as I was reading this chapter, I kept saying, what about, what about, what about? Mm -hmm. And then finally I said, oh, at last, there it is. And then I went, I don't believe it. So let me explain why I went through this process, okay? So as I read your chapter about big businesses that kind of rent-seek and behave badly and abuse their position, all this, I thought, where's the technology companies? Why, why is Facebook not here? Why is Google not here? Why is Apple not here? Why is Amazon not here? And I'm, I'm sitting there going, where are these bloody technology companies? You know, Tesco's and the banks, fair enough, you know, but what about them? And then finally you get to Amazon, ah, oh, at last. You know, there's one of these kind of behemoths, you know, that you're going to recognize they're an issue. And you talk about Amazon and what they do, and then you have this lovely line, you say, I'm sure if Jeff Bezos knew about it, he would, he'd stop it. You know, he, if he knew that these bad things are happening in his factories, he wouldn't going to do it. And I thought... Why do you want, why, why is it you want to exempt the, t I mean, you know, Facebook using our data and Google having 90% of searches and Apple in their factories and, if you've just got a particular predisposition to be forgiving of technology companies when they behave badly? I think that the, uh, the it comes, it's exactly the same argument about competition. And actually competition maybe is, is the wrong word. If we're being really precise, it's contestability. It's the ability of a competitor to come along and take away your business. And what is typically true in the technology sector, unlike other sectors, is that even though you may be very dominant, you can lose that dominance practically overnight. And you've seen that happen time and time again. The speed with which some of these big companies are just knocked off their perch by uh, a new upstart rival is really uh, you know, different to, to what's happened in... But aren't they... No, sorry, I'm, I'm going to challenge you that. It seems to me what their strategy now is to do is to buy those upstart rivals, quite often close them down regardless of whether they're any good. If they threat, or any threat, kind of pull the talented people into their company and yeah. continue to grow. That's right. No, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's called an acqui-hire, I think. It is you know, called acqui-hire, exactly. yeah. So um, I think that... Uh, no, I don't think that, that alters the point at all. If, if they can be challenged by a competitor... Um, and the competitor does well, then what's wrong with that? I think the, the point I was making in relation to Amazon was, was slightly different, which was that <laughs> it's actually a little bit more like the JetBlue story, which is the, the, the particular case here in, in, in relation to Amazon was that um, there was someone who worked there who described the experience of working in an Amazon uh, distribution center. The, in fact, the point that I make is that often the, the internet can give a kind of clean facade to a business, but behind it, there's stuff going on that um, is not so agreeable. Now, we all may welcome the convenience that Amazon offers and, and so on, but actually the account of someone working in a distribution center is pretty inhuman. They're required to, uh, the story, to, to wear a personal GPS tracker everywhere they go in order that their movements can be monitored to make sure that they are, when they literally go and get more human off the shelf and put it in the box or whatever they do, um, they, work, they walk the most efficient route through the distribution center. And, and an extension of that, if they, use, if they want to go to the toilet, and they, uh, there's a theme here, I guess, about there is, using yeah. the toilet. Uh, if they want to go to a, a toilet um, and they use one that is not on the most efficient route, if they use the wrong toilet, then they are reprimanded. And the point I was making was that this is obviously a system that has been set up by 
some combination of you know accountants and management consultants and business experts and so on to maximize efficiency for you the consumer but the result is an inhuman treatment of that person now the point i was making is that if the ceo of amazon was actually face to face with that but it's just like the jet blue thing if they're face to face with that worker and was, was told that this work you you went to the wrong toilet i just don't believe that he would have a go at him about that, because it just feels like that's not how a human being would behave to another human being. So, so, so it's about how systems in business can, t can lead to, that are designed with efficiency in mind, can actually lead to inhuman outcomes. And that is, tr and I, that is true in Amazon, it's true in all sorts of businesses. Let's take another round of questions from the middle now. So we'll take the lady here, and then we'll take these two gentlemen back there, if their hands up for a while. Try and keep it short if you can, folks. Yes, hello. I'm Antonia Swinson. I'm a fellow of the RSA. I'm also chief executive of the Ethical Property Foundation. We've got a new um, ethical workplace accreditation where we go into big business and they have to evidence their commitment, not just to the people in the workplace, including contractor staff, but also in the environment, but also the community outside the doors. Mm -hmm. And so I'm now going into big <coughs> corporates, and we're a charity, and every penny goes to our... Uh, property advice service for non -pro for small community groups and charities but it's that link between business and the community outside the front doors and of course as we all know poverty is when the bricks go through the windows so actually um, what are the system I, mean, I believe we have a mechanism this, this ethical property foundation for connecting with the community but actually if if going uh, I haven't finished your book I'm halfway through but uh, how um, what are the mechanisms that I mean, we think we've got one? It's the beginning of the, you know, we hope the fair trademark for workplace management. But uh, h how do you, where would you see business connecting with the very people you're talking about in schools, hospitals, outside their front door? Okay, then there's a gentleman there. Yeah, we, I, yeah, well, you first, and yeah, then okay. pass it along. Yeah, All right, thanks. Uh, good evening. My name is Rob Cameron, fellow of the RSA, and I had a point that was coming up from earlier on, but I'm really confused now because I run a consulting firm called Sustainability, all about what you've just been talking about, and my wife runs a boutique B&B in Cambridge. She's not a psychopath. It's really wonderful, <laughs> actually. Really <laughs> no, nice. I did say there were some really great ones as well. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, so... You seem to be coming at this largely from the point of view of institutions, certainly in terms of the earlier thread, the scale of institutions, and, and you touched on it just briefly, and you're talking about putting people first. My point is, um, in the same way as Julia was talking earlier on, what about investing in teachers? What about investing in care workers? What about investing in community workers? What about investing in the people that actually are at the front line? You know, it seems to me that uh, if we think of it in those terms rather than the institution, you know, we might get somewhere with this. The big institutions that we have in terms of schools actually have some utility. You know, you get the opportunity for there to be dance teachers, you know, music teachers, art teachers, sports. You know, where does that happen if we, if we don't invest in teachers and think about education in terms of what teachers can bring and what care workers can bring, what community people can bring? Thank you. Pass the mic along. Uh, hi, Steve. My name's Simon. Um, this is kind of wide-ranging. It's the fact that don't you think that a lot of these issues are down to the fact that our success criteria are wrong, be that the NHS, it's the fact that we're reducing waiting lists, schools, it's, it's lead tables, business, it's profit. Do you think that, or is there an answer to how you can quantify what success mm. means in a, in a human-centered world? Great, and, and then in responding to that last point, Steve, you know, you, 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 your, your, the government you were part of was very open about the fact it was going to kind of smash the target culture. I think if you said to most public sector workers, do you feel in a, you, you work in a sector which has, uh, which has benefited from a smashing of the target culture, they'd give you a kind of wry smile. So why is it so hard to do? Okay. Um, could, could I go in order? I think that the, your arguments about um, I, I, ethical business and so on, uh, 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 I completely agree. I, for many years of my life, that's what I did. I set up a company called Good Business, uh, which was a, a consulting firm that w worked for big companies to try and help them to become more uh, socially and environmentally responsible. So that's a world I know well and, spent, and wrote a book about, and I, I agree that that's really important. But the point I make in this book is that when I, when I wrote that previous book, I think I was a little naive in my um, expectation of what that kind of uh, pressure could achieve. 
it's fantastic. There are great stories. There's lots of progress being made. But I think that um, it is just not delivering quickly enough the kind of change across the business world that we want to see. And that's why in this book I've tried to go... Uh, that's why I keep coming back to the structural argument. I think that if there are things that we could do that would affect business uh, sort of systemically, that would be preferable. Not instead of, but as well. I think you'd get the kind of change we want quicker. Um, and also, I think there is a role for regulation here. So there's, in, in, in terms of, for example, how companies treat their workers, I make a, a case in the book for all companies to be required by regulation to pay a living wage. I think that's just the basic thing we should expect, that people who work full-time ought to be able to live on what they earn. That's not happening for millions of people. Um, and so that's, that's an example of an intervention which is just, a, you know, you could, you could describe it as a good old-fashioned you know, statist centralizing intervention. You know, I have no qualms about that because for me, the argument that goes through this book, the theme of the book, is not whether you're for the state or for the government or this or that. It's about whether you're, you know, it's the human thing that really matters. And I think that therefore, for some of these business practices, regulation is the answer. Um, I couldn't agree more in terms of people. Um, if you read the book, you'll see that. Um, I place great emphasis, precisely for the reason that you make, the reason that, reasons that you give, um, on the, in the end, the only way of actually dealing with some of the social problems that, that, that we, we care about, really dealing with them, really helping a family get its life back on track so that they can escape poverty and, and climb the ladder of opportunity, um, to really help... Um, parents in difficult neighborhoods in challenging circumstances to to bring up their children in ways that give that child that child a chance in life in the end it's one-to-one -one help from from a from a really involved uh, representative of um the state and that's why i make an argument in here for some of the things we did and i think they should we, in, in the last government we should do more of you know health visitors for me are a great example of what you're talking about where I think it's one of the you know, most important things we can do is to, is to invest in um, that kind of early intervention. And health visitors um, are a brilliant way of doing that. They need more. That's why we, you know, as I said, for lots of people, the experience of a health visitor is very poor because the caseloads are too high, etc. That's why we need to recruit many more so you can reduce the caseload, give them better training so they can help with a wider range of family circumstances. We started to do that. To be honest, I, I don't know how far that's got, but that was a policy that we introduced. The same with the Troubled Families Program, which um, I set up with uh, Louise Casey, who we both know well, running it, to give families a family worker that will really focus on their needs uh, so that they can coordinate services for them locally and so do, do the target question because I want the one, target, more, sorry, one, the one more round in before the we target finish. question again I, I really agree I think on a, in a sort of macro level um, I think that some of these numbers that we use to measure success are hopeless I mean my favorite um, sort of takedown in the book actually because it, it's become so kind of um, preeminent in our conversations it goes back to education the PISA rankings which every time they come out we're going up or down on the PISA rankings and, and it's, it's a taken on this status of, you know, the oracle. You know, uh, and, and until I really dug into it, I thought the PISA rankings on educational performance were some kind of international objective benchmark of education where they look at different systems and, and try and normalize the results. It's nothing of the sort. It's a test that's taken by a handful of children in various countries, completely differently administered. Um, you can get results from, you can get PISA results on maths for a country with not a single child from that country having done a maths question on the PISA test. Uh, it's ridiculous, and yet we put, place such great emphasis on it. It's the same with the GDP, GDP figures. In terms of targets, honestly, I don't know. I mean, that was, I think that is that tension that, you, that we know well, which is you've got to kind of show results as well as, um, as, as, well as pursue a philosophical approach, which is about letting go. Uh, we, Oliver Letman and I used to d describe the shift that we wanted to make in terms of uh, the role of government of, uh, from being one of bureaucratic accountability, where you're using the, the sort of uh, systems of bureaucracy targets and measurement and so on to ensure that standards are raising, rising, to democratic accountability, where you're using mechanisms like... Um, transparency, reporting of data, the ability of people to make choices to ensure rising standards. Um, I don't know, frankly, to what extent that, that shift has happened. You're suggesting it hasn't. But. 
just to close, because I'm really sorry for the, all those people who want to ask questions. I'm afraid you'll have to read the book to get the answer to the question that I didn't manage to ask you to, uh, to get you to ask. I just want to finish with this, Steve. At the end of the book, you encourage us all to become politicians. Um, but I noticed yes. you don't encourage us all to become conservative politicians. Um, and I'm just interested in your own personal journey in that regard. You know, you, you work for David Cameron, you pay tribute to David Cameron in, in, in this book. But it feels to me as though you have kind of moved beyond, as it were, your conservative stage. There are things the Conservative Party does which you agree with and some things that they do which you don't agree with. But you seem to me to have become non-aligned at this stage in your journey. Is that, is that correct? Uh, I very deliberately wanted this book to not be a political book in the, in the party political sense. I wanted to make some arguments about what's going on in the world and try and make sense of it somehow from the perspective of having been inside the system uh, in a way that would appeal to, to people who uh, support any party who aren't particularly political. So that was a really conscious choice, and that applies to the end, where I think it's really important if, if, you know, if those of you who read the book and agree with the message of the book and the arguments, even if you don't necessarily agree with the specific recommendations, um, if you agree with the general direction, then the, the, the point I make is that we do need more people in... Well, actually, let's take a step back. The real point is that in our system, the right way to resolve all this, in the end, is the political process. Um, and so it's no use, I think, just I think there's a tendency to sort of rail against government and politics and, oh, it's all terrible and they speak this weird language and let's just sort of ignore it or go around it or, or, or just yell at the, at the, into the air. And I just think that's not constructive. I think we need people to, in the end, get involved and take back the levers of power. And I think it's about getting more people who are independent-minded, who may run for a party but be independent-minded, or literally independent to run for office. I hope we have more offices that people can run for in terms of elected mayors in, in, in our big cities and also much lower down. So that's what I'd like to see. For me personally, um, I think that that's, that's a pretty accurate description. I think that um, I don't see myself as uh, a partisan figure. I think that there's a set of ideas I really want to advance and I'm happy to work with anyone to move them forward because I think this is what needs to happen to make the world a better place. Thanks, Steve. So uh, this is a very racy book, so you'll have to you have to buy it to find out what institution Steve refers to as being a cesspit of corruption. Uh, you'll have to buy the book to find out which members of the British establishment he thinks are more corrupt than Vladimir Putin's uh, regime. I won't, I won't spoil that for you. You'll need to get the book uh, to read it. Steve, it's been great speaking to you in your kind of coalition-themed... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, outfit here. Um, I've never actually had a speaker who's taken his shoes off before, but nor have I had a speaker who coordinates his socks and trousers in the way that you have done. Um, it has been in every way. Of course, you have coordinated your dress with the, with the book, which is beautifully done. It's been a pleasure. Please join me in thanking Steve Hilton. The book, the book is available outside and Steve is available to sign it.